from the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska. This is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. I can't imagine the agony of losing a child for any reason. But how does a mother cope when she learns someone murdered her daughter and she knows terror and pain must have marked the last moments of her child's life? The book Justice for Bonnie deals with this issue. The well-written book profiles a mother's fight to learn the truth about what happened to her daughter. Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Karen Foster and her boyfriend Jim had been looking forward to a Florida getaway for several months. Jim worked as a firefighter and paramedic in Anchorage, and Karen was a real estate agent and a volunteer reserve undercover police officer. When Jim's brother Ken called to tell them he was getting married in Florida, Karen and Jim began planning their trip. Karen's three youngest kids, Samantha 12, Adam, 13, and Bonnie, 18, would stay with Karen's ex-husband, Gary. Her oldest son, Jason, 20, lived on his own. Jim also had three kids who would stay with his ex-wife while he and Karen were in Florida. Karen's oldest daughter, Bonnie, was a full-time college student at the University of Alaska in Anchorage, and she was very responsible. Karen knew she would be there to help watch over the younger kids if necessary. Karen and Jim felt they had nothing to worry about, and they planned to relax and enjoy the Florida sunshine for a few days. They arrived in Florida on September 26, 1994, and they rented a sailboat and sailed from St. Petersburg to the tiny town of St. Mark's. On September 28, after a pleasant dinner with Jim's brother, Ken, and other members of Jim's family, Jim and Karen returned to their boat and headed for their bunks. Footsteps on the deck awakened Karen at 3 a.m. She heard a knock and opened the companionway to see Ken's grim face. Only half awake, Karen could not understand why Ken had driven back to the marina. Ken looked into Karen's eyes, his own eyes misting with tears. He then broke the terrible news. Bonnie was dead. She died in a hiking accident. Karen reacted with anger and disbelief, but Ken handed her a scrap of paper. On it, he had scribbled an Alaska phone number and a state trooper's name. Jim walked Karen to a payphone and dialed the number for her. She was connected with Sergeant Mike Mars of the Alaska State Troopers. Mars told her he was sorry to inform her Bonnie's body was found at McHugh Creek, where she died from a fall off a cliff. Nothing, the trooper said, made sense to Karen. She asked Sergeant Mars who Bonnie was with when she died. He told her she was with no one. She was alone at McHugh Creek. How did she get there? Karen asked Sergeant Mars. She told him Bonnie did not drive, so how did she get to McHugh Creek? 10 miles from her bus route. Mars said he did not know how Bonnie got to McHugh Creek. Karen asked what time Bonnie's body was found, and when Mars said Bonnie was found at 2.30 that afternoon, Karen said it was impossible because Bonnie would have been in class at 2.30, and Bonnie never missed her classes. Karen felt certain the body the troopers recovered was someone other than her daughter. She asked Mars how the body was identified. He said she did not have her wallet or ID on her, but her name was on her class ring she was wearing. Karen was still not convinced and asked if anyone who knew her had identified her. 
Marr said they were waiting for Karen to make the identification. Karen asked Mars if the young woman had been raped, and he said no, all her clothes were on, nothing was ripped or torn, all her buttons were done up, as was her zipper. Mars repeated that Bonnie died in a hiking accident from a fall off a 30-foot cliff, but he could not explain why her backpack and wallet were missing, or how and why she was at McHugh Creek. Karen did not believe Bonnie was dead until she returned to Anchorage and identified her child's body in the morgue. She knew then she could either give up or fight to keep going. Her method of coping with the loss of her child was to demand answers and to examine her daughter's death from the viewpoint of a police detective. The troopers continued to say Bonnie's death was an accident, but Karen did not accept this conclusion. At one time, Karen had been a news reporter in Anchorage, and she still had connections in the business. So she began to accept invitations to talk to the media. She told reporters her daughter was murdered, and she begged anyone who saw Bonnie near McHugh Creek on the day she died to come forward and talk to the state troopers. When the family gathered at the funeral home to view Bonnie's body, Karen picked up Bonnie's hand and noticed her knuckles were enlarged and bruises covered her arms. Karen immediately knew these were defensive wounds. Bonnie fought with someone before she fell off the cliff. Karen called the troopers and told them what she saw. She wondered how the authorities missed bruises so obvious even her younger children noticed them. When the troopers downplayed her ob observations, Karen did not understand why they weren't investigating her daughter's death. The day after the visit to the funeral home, Sergeant Mars asked Karen to come down to the station. She thought the troopers found something, but instead Mars asked her not to talk to the media and not to say Bonnie's death was a murder. He told her she had no evidence to support this statement. She asked him about the broken knuckles and bruised arms. Didn't he think those injuries were evidence of a struggle? Mars told Karen if she provided the media with too much information, she would hinder the troopers' investigation of the case. And she told him she had not seen the troopers make any effort to investigate the case. She asked him if they considered Bonnie's death a homicide, but he refused to say anything more then they were looking at all possibilities. Karen felt the troopers were inept or uncaring, so she decided to investigate Bonnie's death on her own. She followed the route she knew Bonnie took on the day she died. Bonnie would have started walking from her father's home at 5 a.m. It would have been dark, and Karen realized now how far Bonnie had to walk to the bus stop. As Karen walked the route, a moose confronted her on the road. Like any Alaskan, Karen knew a moose protecting its territory could be deadly. She tried to hide behind a lamppost, but the moose followed. A red truck stopped, and the driver offered to give Karen a ride to get away from the moose. But the moose walked away, and Karen told the driver she was fine. Karen wondered if something similar had happened to Bonnie. Did Bonnie encounter an aggressive moose, and did her killer stop? and offer to drive her to the bus stop? Six weeks passed, and despite frequent calls to Sergeant Mars, Karen was unable to learn anything about the investigation into her daughter's death. The lack of information cemented the idea in Karen's mind that the troopers were incompetent. The troopers told Karen they were reluctant to divulge information to her because of her frequent press conferences. They wanted to keep some details quiet. Sergeant Mars suggested Karen contact the support group called Victims for Justice. He told her the group could help her in some ways the troopers could not. 
Karen didn't like to think of herself as a victim, but she reluctantly called the number Mars gave her. A woman named Janice answered the phone and invited Karen to the group's headquarters where they could talk. When Karen arrived at the Office of Victims for Justice, she was greeted by a thin woman with short, dark hair. The woman introduced herself as Janice Linehart and told Karen that when her parents were brutally murdered nine years earlier and she and her sister Sharon tried to get information about the investigation, they learned victims in Alaska had no rights in the criminal justice process. Janice said she and her sister endured a nightmare and they did not want others to experience the same helplessness. They formed Victims for Justice and began lobbying legislators for laws to protect victims and their families and to make the families part of the judicial process. Janice told Karen their organization was still small, but there were several ways they could help Karen. Karen said she wanted to see Bonnie's autopsy report but the troopers would not allow her to see it. Janice said she couldn't promise anything, but told Karen she would look into the matter. Three months after Bonnie's murder, Karen was surprised when a woman named Sandy Cassidy called and said she and several other people in the community would like to help keep Bonnie's name in the spotlight in the hopes someone might come forward with more information about Bonnie's death. She asked Karen if it would be okay to post flyers and solicit support from the community. Karen jumped at the idea, and people began donating money to the cause. Soon, a reward fund was offered for information regarding Bonnie's death. Leads began to develop, and some of the information came straight to Karen. Each time Karen heard something new, she called Sergeant Mars, and he repeatedly said, Thank you, we'll look into it. He never told her if the troopers followed through on any of the information she and the others provided them. In January 1995, Sergeant Mars called Karen and said he cleared the way for her to see Bonnie's autopsy report. Accompanied by Janice Leinhart, Karen went to the troopers' post, where Mars introduced her to Dr. Thompson, the coroner who performed Bonnie's autopsy. Thompson handed the autopsy report to Karen to read. I'm taking a short break from the story to thank the wonderful creative folks at the puzzle game app Best Fiends for supporting this podcast. I appreciate you. I'm sure by now everybody has heard of Best Fiends. It is a fun, colorful game you can play offline. I love to solve mysteries, both real and fictional, and Best Fiends is a puzzle game that sharpens my mind while I'm having fun. When a true crime story begins to weigh me down, I play Best Fiends for a few minutes to lighten my mood and reset my brain. Best Fiends is a bright, cheerful game with thousands of fun levels of puzzles to solve. Each level requires only a few minutes to complete, but you might have to repeat it several times before you successfully finish all the assigned tasks and can move on to the next puzzle. I've been doing fairly well lately, speeding through the levels of the towering treetops, but I suspect my fiends and I will soon hit a puzzle that stumps us for a few days. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Karen was shocked to see the manner of death on the autopsy report listed as a homicide. The troopers never told Karen that Bonnie's death was ruled a homicide, and they never even allowed her to see Bonnie's death certificate. Now she understood the troopers always believed someone murdered Bonnie. 
It was difficult, but Karen forced herself to read the autopsy report. Bonnie suffered multiple blunt force trauma injuries to the head, and her left index finger was fractured. She had 11 uniform lacerations on the back of her head, an injury the coroner found strange. Dr. Thompson told Karen he found minor tearing in Bonnie's vaginal walls. While this alone was not enough to prove rape, he felt the tearing, along with the defensive wounds on Bonnie's hands and arms, suggested she was sexually assaulted. He said the only good news was the murderer left his DNA in the form of semen inside Bonnie. The news about the semen made Karen both sick and hopeful. Maybe with the DNA they would be able to catch the monster who raped and murdered her daughter. The troopers questioned several suspects, including a young man who worked with Bonnie at Sam's Club. Bonnie complained to her supervisor about her co-worker, claiming he took her phone number from her employment file and was calling her at home. The troopers asked Karen if Bonnie ever mentioned the co-worker to her, but Karen said she hadn't. The troopers questioned the co-worker, but a sample of his DNA did not match the sample taken from Bonnie. Troopers then questioned another co-worker who missed a meeting at work on the morning Bonnie was killed, but his DNA also was not a match. A fellow college student in Bonnie's English class became a suspect because troopers saw him at McHugh Creek when they recovered Bonnie's body. Since psychopaths often revisit their crime scene, troopers found it suspicious that the young man happened to be present at the body recovery scene of someone he knew. When his DNA did not match the sample taken from Bonnie, the troopers dismissed him as a suspect. Bonnie's English teacher contacted Karen and showed her the violent entries written by the student in his journal. When Karen read what he wrote, she felt certain the troopers had let the killer walk free. She called Mars, but he told her not only did the young man's DNA not match the sample taken from inside Bonnie, but he had an airtight alibi for the time of the crime. Months turned to years, and Karen began to think Bonnie's killer would never be brought to justice. In January 2007, more than 12 years after Bonnie's murder, Karen was on vacation in the Philippines when she received an email from investigator Timothy Hunyon of the Alaska Bureau of Investigation Cold Case Unit. Hunyon said there were developments in Bonnie's case. He said during a routine search of CODIS, the national database for DNA profiles, a match occurred between the DNA profile collected from Bonnie's body and one recently taken from an individual currently in prison for robbery in New Jersey. Kenneth Dion was the man's name. Karen had never heard of him, but according to Hunyon, Dion lived in Anchorage at the time of Bonnie's murder. Hunyon and another trooper flew to New Jersey to interview Dion in prison. Dion denied ever meeting Bonnie Craig, but while boasting to the troopers about being a fifth-degree karate black belt, he told them he was an expert with martial arts weapons. They asked him what kind of weapons, and he said mainly the psi. He described the psi as a prong-like weapon resembling a fork. The troopers were surprised when Dion volunteered. He not only had, but was proficient with the use of a sigh. When they re-examined the photos of the wounds on the back of Bonnie's head, the troopers realized the marks could have been made by a sigh. Karen expected Dion's immediate extradition to Alaska, and she grew frustrated with how long the process took. On April 27, 2007, Kenneth Dion still had not been extradited to Alaska but prosecutors formally charged him in an Anchorage courtroom with first-degree murder, second-degree murder with intent to cause serious injury, second-degree murder with extreme indifference, and first-degree sexual assault. Once prosecutors charged Dion, 
Karen realized she no longer needed to keep looking for Bonnie's murderer. Instead, she decided to focus her energy on lobbying. Like Janice Leinhart before her, Karen wanted to do something to help other families avoid the nightmare she and her family had endured over the years. And she wanted one good thing to come from Bonnie's horrible death. Kenneth Dion had been arrested 18 times over the years. Ten were misdemeanors and eight were felonies. If his DNA had been collected during his earlier arrests, detectives would have solved Bonnie's murder in months and maybe even in weeks. Karen decided to focus her energy on changing the law, not only in Alaska, but in every state. Karen learned that by 2007, only six states collected DNA on felony arrest, and Alaska was not one of them. Karen contacted the governor and a state senator, and within 12 days, they passed a bill making Alaska the seventh state in the union to collect DNA on felony arrest. Karen began to speak and lobby, not only on a local level, but nationwide, for the collection of DNA on felony arrest instead of just on felony conviction, as most states then did. A wealthy philanthropist who started an organization aimed at helping missing and exploited children offered Karen a job in his office in Florida to pursue her cause. She jumped at the opportunity and moved to Florida. After a series of delays, Kenneth Dion's trial for the rape and murder of Bonnie Craig finally began on May 10, 2011, 16 and one half years after Bonnie's death. The prosecution had little evidence other than the DNA, but the DNA match was conclusive, and Dion's lawyer did not try to deny it was Dion's DNA found inside Bonnie. The defense claimed Kenneth Dion and Bonnie engaged in a consensual sexual encounter at some point before the morning she disappeared on her way to the university. When troopers first investigated the crime scene, they found a drop of Bonnie's blood on a leaf at the top of the bluff overlooking McHugh Creek. Prosecutors claimed this was evidence Bonnie was injured before she fell off the cliff. The defense countered there should have been more blood if she was bludgeoned on top the cliff. The coroner testified the blows on the back of her head, which killed her, were, were uniform in shape and depth and could not have been caused by hitting her head on a fall from the cliff. A defense expert disagreed with the coroner and said he believed the injuries were caused by her head hitting rocks on her fall into the creek. Karen was worried when the judge handed the case to the jury. Had the prosecutors proved their case, or would jurors believe there was insufficient evidence to rule out the possibility of consensual sex between Bonnie and Kenneth Dion? Before long, she learned the answer to her question. The jury returned the next morning with the verdict. Kenneth Dion was found guilty on all counts and was later sentenced to 124 years in prison. An onlooker might believe the DNA evidence alone put Kenneth Dion behind bars, but the truth is not so simple. As I mentioned, when CODIS revealed the DNA taken from Bonnie matched a felon in New Jersey named Kenneth Dion, cold case investigator Timothy Hunyon and another trooper flew back to New Jersey to interview Dion. In court, jurors were shown a video of the interview. When the trial was over, one juror told the press it was during this interview when she and several other jurors decided Dion was guilty. When Hunyon showed Dion a photo of Bonnie and asked him if he knew Bonnie, Dion barely glanced at the photo, said he'd never seen the young woman in the photo, and then began to act nervous. The DNA led investigators to Kenneth Dion, 
But just as Dion's defense attorney repeatedly claimed during the trial, the sexual encounter when Dion left sperm in Bonnie could have been consensual, and it could have happened the day before Bonnie was murdered. It was Hunyon's interrogation of Dion which closed the case and convinced jurors of Dion's guilt. Troopers admitted they made some mistakes in dealing with Karen and her family. From the beginning, they should have told the family they were suspicious about the cause of Bonnie's death and were investigating it as a homicide. Karen admitted, though, the troopers were not incompetent. They conducted a good, thorough investigation into the murder of her daughter. It must have been difficult for Trooper Mars to withhold specifics of the investigation from Bonnie's family. But he was dealing with a headstrong mother with investigative skills of her own. I'm sure he did not want the investigation to spiral out of his control or for the press to obtain details the troopers did not want to divulge to the public. It took a long time to bring Bonnie's killer to justice, but law enforcement can't be blamed for the delay. Days after Kenneth Dion's DNA was entered into CODIS, a weekly check by Alaskan authorities found the match to the sample taken from Bonnie. DNA is a powerful tool for linking victims to criminals. Kenneth Dion would never have been caught and arrested for Bonnie's death if he hadn't left a DNA sample in her or if he had managed to stay out of jail. It is a miracle Bonnie's murderer was ever found. Today, more than 30 states require DNA upon felony arrest. Some people feel the collection of DNA is an evasion of privacy. But police collect fingerprints when a person is arrested. How is a cheek swab any more invasive? Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. You can also search for this podcast on Patreon to learn more about the Last Frontier Club. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Thank you.